Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Thursday Bible Life today. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. We're going to be in chapter number 18 this morning, and we're going to be looking at the destruction of economic or commercial or political Babylon. Last week in chapter 17, we saw the destruction of religious Babylon, or some call it ecclesiastical Babylon, and some refer to it as the apostate church. So if you'll get your Bibles and turn to chapter 18, and we'll get started in just a moment. As I said, chapter 18 deals with economic Babylon or political Babylon, in contrast to the religious Babylon that we saw destroyed last week, we can picture that there are a couple of entities that are related to Babylon in the tribulation period or Daniel's 70th week. The first one from chapter 17, the apostate church or the religious Babylon, it appears to me is used by the Antichrist, the beast that comes up out of the sea representing the Gentile nations, which I believe he will come from somewhere within the revived Roman Empire, which covers a lot of territory. But the, it appears to me that he will use religious Babylon or the apostate church to gain or solidify the infrastructure of his one world global system for his economic and political system, of which he will be the head ruler. And we saw last week that there would be 10 kings that would be given authority and power by the beast uh, to rule with him for a short period of time. And they would be used by him to destroy religious Babylon. And so we see that the kings of the earth hated religious Babylon, but we will see today that the kings of the earth love political or commercial Babylon. And we'll see a couple of different viewpoints about the destruction of this uh, political or commercial or economic Babylon. There will be rejoicing that comes from heaven and there will be great wailing and mourning from the earth and the kings of the earth. And these kings of the earth, in my mind, I picture to be the head of what I think will be 10 regions around the globe that will have been, the earth will be divided into those, kin, those 10 areas or regions, which fits the desire in many places in the globe today that we see a disintegration of national boundaries and so these 10 kings or rulers of these 10 areas or regions will support and give their allegiance to the beast, the Antichrist. And remember that he wants to be the one to be worshipped. And that's one of the reasons or the, maybe the main reason that he's going to have the religious Babylon, the apostate church, to be destroyed so that there won't be any worship of anything or anyone other than himself, who will be, uh, by that time, I think, possessed by the devil. And that has been Satan's desire from the very beginning for people to worship him. So last week we talked about religious Babylon being described as a city built on seven hills. And it's very easy to associate that with the city of Rome, which is built on seven hills. And the Roman church from ancient times has developed quite an infrastructure around the world. And we're not saying that all Catholics will be involved in this false religion or apostate religion, because I believe that there are potentially true believers that are within that organization but it appears to me that the infrastructure that they have that is global uh, will be a very good tool for the Antichrist or the beast to use to develop the infrastructure for his one world system. So we might consider that it's easy to 
associate Rome with religious Babylon, but this commercial or political Babylon, the beast system, appears to be a Babylon that would be a different city or a different location than Rome. And it will be a place where after the true church and the believers have been raptured off of the earth and the tribulation period starts, that all the seemingly headquarters and the economic uh, most important place will be in wherever this commercial Babylon is located. And there's been several books and many commentaries written that have differing opinions of who and where this particular Babylon will be. There have been some that thought it would be the original Babylon over on the Euphrates River, although that if that's the case, it might be relocated from the original place as uh, the Euphrates River has changed locations uh, somewhat from where the original Babel or Babylon was thousands of years ago. But there are people that adhere to thinking that commercial Babylon or economic Babylon will be there. There are others that think that it will be some other place in the Middle East. And there's even a few people that have uh, given their opinion that the Babylon that's spoken of here in chapter 18 uh, fits the United States, especially the New York area as being a uh, economic capital of the world. But I have a tendency to anticipate that it will be somewhere over in the Middle East, my personal opinion, that would still be within the area that would be the revived Roman Empire geographic locations. So we probably won't know that for certain. We can speculate. But my opinion is that the, the true church and believers will be raptured even before the true Antichrist is revealed. And he won't be revealed until he affirms that covenant with the nation of Israel for a seven-year period. So all of that being said, let's get started reading chapter 18. I'll begin reading in verse number one. After these things, there's that word that's translated from the Greek word meta tauta, after these things. So when we get to chapter 18 and we read after these things, I believe that it's a reference to after all these things that take place in the tribulation period that we've read from chapter six all the way up through chapter 17. And now at the end of chapter 18, which I think represents the end of the tribulation period, because we saw last week that religious Babylon was destroyed by the 10 kings that supported and showed their allegiance to the beast. But we see that commercial Babylon will be destroyed <clears throat> by Christ himself when he returns to set up his own eternal kingdom. So verse one, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great authority and the earth was illuminated with his glory. So after these things, meta tauta, after all of the events of the tribulation period, another angel, we've seen the another angel phrase several times in our reading through the chapters in Revelation. This one seems to have the appearance of having a higher rank or authority or power than the other ones that we've seen. And yet we do not believe it is the Lord Jesus Christ because he's not ever referred to as an angel except in the Old Testament where it speaks of him as the angel of the Lord, a pre-incarnate uh, occurrence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here I believe this is just one of God's holy angels that is very powerful. And he comes down and uh, he seems to <clears throat> have great authority and rank. Verse two says, he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Dr. McGee points out that based off of this particular couple of verses, he believes that 
wherever this is located, this particular Babylon, will be a place where the demons and unclean birds will be incarcerated during the millennial kingdom age. This, I thought, was an interesting comment. And we have read a prophetic statement about this destruction of Babylon way back in chapter 14 and verse 8, where it said, Another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Remember that when God says something, even prophetically, it's as good as done because God brings about all of his prophecies literally just as he says. So when he says something is done, even though it was prophetically mentioned way back in chapter 14, which was several months or years before we're coming to this place in chapter 18, it's as good as done. So this angel, another angel that came out of heaven, pronounced the destruction and uh, Babylon, the economic or political or commercial Babylon, which represents the one world system of the ant beast or the Antichrist is being destroyed. There are several Old Testament chapters that speak about the destruction of Babylon. Isaiah chapters 13 and 14 and Jeremiah chapters 49 and 50 speak of the destruction of Babylon that will now come to fruition in this chapter 18 of Revelation. Verse number three says, for all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. This represents God's judgment on big business that denied God's true authority and sought after the blessings of luxury and the authority given to them by the beast system. Verse number four says, I heard another voice come from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, lest you receive of her plagues. This is a verse that's a little bit difficult for me. Some see this as the Lord calling his people to become believers and to come out of the beast system. Others see this as a gathering of God's people who have miraculously made it alive in their human bodies through the tribulation period and are being called or gathered back to the promised land uh, at the time when the Lord comes back and he's preparing to uh, utterly destroy his enemies and this commercial Babylon, the beast system. Verse number five says, for her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. At that point, it makes me realize that it's wonderful to think that God does not remember my sin and my iniquity or any believer's sins. He does not remember. In fact, the psalmist has said that he has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. And the only judgment that believers will go through will be the judgment seat of Christ, where it's not to determine whether we have entrance into heaven or not, but it's to determine what type of reward or loss of reward we will receive. Our salvation and the judgment of our sins took place on the cross when Jesus paid our sin debt for us, so that when we trust in Christ as our Savior and believe what the Bible says about him being God's Son, and our kinsman redeemer, and that our sins have been paid for by his shed blood. It is if, as I've said several times before, back in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, when there would be a blood sacrifice brought to the temple, the person who brought it and the priest also would lay their hands upon the forehead of that innocent sacrificial animal, thereby signifying that their sin was transferred to that innocent sacrifice and their sins would be taken care of and covered by the blood of that innocent sacrifice. So that when we trust in Christ as our savior, 
it's as if we have placed our hands upon him as he was on the cross, transferring our sins to him. And the Bible says that his righteousness has been imputed to us. So our sins won't be remembered. But here, the sins of these unsaved, unbelieving people associated with the beast system will be remembered and come up before heaven. But the sins of the unsaved, these people, are remembered and will determine the torment that they receive for all of eternity. Verse number six says, Remember or render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plague will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. So, pretty tough words there about the judgment that's coming upon this unbelieving one world system and upon Babylon representing the beast system. So now we come to verse 9 through 19 and we see the different viewpoints of the judgment that's coming upon commercial Babylon. First we'll see the world's viewpoint and we'll see that the world will mourn and be in great despair because of the judgment and the destruction of the beast system. <clears throat> Verse number nine and following. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her. When they see the smoke of her burning, standing at the distance for fear of the torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. For no one buys their merchandise anymore, merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and even bodies and souls of men. The fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you. And all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you. And you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, who became rich by her, will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, great city, in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been made desolate. So these things that are listed here in these verses that I read, 9 through 19, they're not symbols. They're literal goods. And even people who have been bought and sold and traded for a profit 
and for luxury and pleasure. So now we come to verse 20 through 24 and we see the response from heaven and it will be joy instead of weeping. It will be rejoicing instead of wailing. Verse 20, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. We read in the Bible that vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And we're encouraged not to get vengeance on our own, but to wait upon the Lord to gain vengeance on our behalf. And this is when that takes place. Verse 21, Then a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus, with violence, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of the harpist, the musicians, the flutists, the trumpets shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more. The sound of the millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you any more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, bride shall not be heard in you any more. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by you and your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets, the saints, and of all who were slain on earth. So there's great joy and rejoicing in heaven upon the destruction of Babylon. There was a book that was written way back, I think, in the late 1700s, just before 1800. The man who wrote it was named Edward Gibbon, and the book was entitled The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And in that book, he listed five particular reasons that he felt like the Roman Empire crumbled. And I'm going to read those. The first one is the undermining of dignity and sanctity of the home, the basis of human society. The second one was higher and higher taxes, the spending of public money for free bread and circuses or entertainment and luxury for much of the population. The third one was a mad craze for pleasure, sports becoming more and more exciting and brutal and immoral. The next one was the building of great armaments when the real enemy was within, the decay of the individual responsibility. And the fifth reason that he pointed out as his opinion for the demise of the Roman Empire the first time, was the decay of religion, faith fading into a mere form and losing touch with life, losing power to guide its people. Those five particular reasons that this man, Edward Gibbon, way back just before 1800, wrote in his book entitled The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, seem to be things that we notice in the world today, don't they? Everything that seems to be going on, whether we read it in scripture or in the headlines of the news or on the internet or wherever you get your news source, seems to be pointing to the fact that the world, as Jan Markell says, is not falling apart. It's falling into place, just as the Lord predicted in the Olivet Discourse and other places in Scripture that we seem to be quickly approaching the end of this age and the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ to set up His eternal kingdom, the first 1,000 years of which will be here on earth when He rules and reigns from the throne of David in Jerusalem. And after that, we'll see the great white throne judgment and sin and Satan being destroyed once and for all and cast into the lake of fire. 
and then will be a new earth and new heavens created. And that kingdom that had been on this earth for a thousand years will then translate into a new heaven and new earth and last for all of eternity. So if you have trusted in Christ as your savior, you have already become a citizen of heaven, of the new Jerusalem. And we can look forward to an eternity without the problems and the trials and the tribulations and heartaches of this world as we know them today. But in the meantime, while we're here, placed here for this particular time in history of man, by God's unique design, he has placed us here for a purpose. Our challenge is to determine and discover what that purpose is and to fulfill it. And just as the Apostle Paul was given a ministry of sharing the gospel message with all who would listen, I believe that that also can be included in our purpose at this time because we all have friends and family and loved ones who need to hear the good news of the gospel message that Jesus has paid for our sins and provides a way of eternal salvation. So as we live amongst times of heartache and fear and great turmoil in the world, we can rest assured knowing that we've read the end of the book and God wins. And we are born again into the family of God and are on the winning side. So we need to pray for those who have not yet trusted in Christ. Pray for our leaders. Pray for God's mercy upon our country and our people that our hearts would be turned back to him. Next week, we'll be looking at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven to earth in great victory. What a grand time that will be. And we'll see that you and I will be coming with him to set him, his kingdom. So chapter 19 is where we'll be next week if you'd like to read ahead. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you, Father, that with all the heartache that we experience and see in the world today, we know that you have said in your word that one day in the future, which we believe is not too far distant at this time, all of that will be put in the rearview mirror and we will enjoy the blessings of eternal life with you. Thank you for the promises of your word. Thank you for those who join us online. We pray for your blessings on them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hope that you can join us on Saturday afternoon where we're going through a study of the various covenants that we find in Scripture. And uh, we'll have these on uh, Facebook and uh, uh, Rumble. And so if you have opportunity to watch, we'll be looking at the Davidic covenant this coming Saturday afternoon. Until then... Have a great rest of the week. Lord bless you.